stakeholders set to restore the lost glory of a center that manages children with disabilities. And federal government awards contracts for the reconstruction of one of the oldest federal highways in the Northeast. You'll get to know more. And communities along the riverbank in Kogi State cry out for help with apprehension of an unpleasant annual visitor. Hello and welcome to the correspondents this week. We have interesting and educative stories that will be worth your while. I'm Zenret Dingmun. Many thanks for joining us. We begin with children with disabilities. Now, do you remember the Child Care Trust? One of the pet projects of the late Stella Obasanjo, right? Well, the center that manages disabilities in children and adolescents has not been on the news for long. Anyway, that is about to change as the Child Care Trust and Petra Speech Early Childhood and Developmental Center are synergizing to revamp the project. Correspondent Elizabeth Omori, who went on a tour of the facility in the Bwari Area Council of the Federal Capital Territory, reports that the center needs the support of governments and individuals to function optimally for the betterment of the special children. Name? Yes. Praise. Amira and Praise are students benefiting from a vision birthed 16 years ago to cater to the needs of children with special needs. The Child Care Trust of late Stella Obasanjo at Bwari can provide shelter for 120 children for emotional support, counseling, education, speech and language therapies, and health care. Following the MOU signed recently, the center is soliciting the support of governments at all levels, parents, donor agencies, and individuals to promote inclusion to make life better for these vulnerable children with unique abilities. Most importantly, these children, uh, we cannot define them by their, uh, their nature, but we define them as people with ability because we believe that the teachers that are going to train them are capable of doing that. And at the end of the day, we are going to succeed in giving them what is needed for them. So my hope and our hope is to see that this place is okay. And we are trusting God that something is going to be done. I know if government try, at least we have to pressurize them to try more because Things are here, it needs a lot of you know, money. So we have to either we in touch with NGOs to assist us. We direct them where we have complaints and we want them to help us. Because children are for everyone. The center will be needing assistance in, uh, in various ways. Like the feeding of the children, we will appreciate if they Either the government or well wishers or collaborators can help us. About 30 million naira per annum will go a long way to be a great support for us in the centre, the running cost of the place. For a particular child, monthly it's 150,000 approximately. Okay, so do you get support from the parents? Uh, we just get minimal support. Basically, a Papa Ulo Obasanjo. Obasanjo helps a great deal in that. Yes. When I walked into this structure last year, I knew I found a place to come back to and to use my skills and my talent for the good of the special needs children that I love so much. Okay, so in what areas would you be working on? We'll be the technical team. They will be taking um, care of their speech and language therapy, uh, psychological ter therapy. We'll be doing the um, testing, screening, assessment, and clinical reporting. We're 
working with the doctor that you just saw spoke today to open a clinic that will help us uh, take the data that we need and then we'll be able to develop a, cur a personalized curriculum for each time that comes through this center. We are also working on the curriculum to make sure that each child is taught according to their skills, ability and uh, time span to be able to achieve the kind of functionality that is required of them. The medical clinic, speech and language labs, physiotherapy room, hearing impaired class, kitchen, intellectual impaired room are part of facilities that require modern equipment to operate effectively. We are not done with Elizabeth Omori as she joins us to speak more on this issue. It's good to see you again, Elizabeth. Thank you for having me, Senret. All right. Now, you visited the Child Care Trust facility. Can you tell us what is the state of the place at this time? Okay, I would say uh, overhauling. The center needs serious overhauling because I had an opportunity to tour the facility from the language lab to the uh, speech lab, physiotherapy lab, clinic, kitchen, resort center, all needing serious overhauling because the facility has the capacity to handle 120 children with several conditions from autism to cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, children with hearing impairment, visual impairment, all needing attention from parents, caregivers, and not just caregivers, not people that are not trained, trained caregivers. So going to that facility reminded me of several things. And I'll start this way. For every situation, you have to be grateful to God because when life gives you a lemon in different flavors. The lemonade you make out of it could come in different shades. Now, these are children with several disability conditions. They need help. They need support from their parents. They need support from their caregivers. They need support from Nigerians. The facility has been there for 16 years. It was the uh, pet project of the late Stella Obasaja, but her family has been doing so much to ensure that that facility, that project does not die. But that center needs the support of all kind-hearted Nigerians, governments at all levels, individuals who are willing to give and to make the lives of these children better. Now, I think that's the, the, the aim of this project. And, and one of the challenges of running such a center is inadequate funding. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the managers doing to overcome this? And now with this um, project that you, you speak of, how are they going to manage the, the challenges? Well, funding is very important because um, from what I heard from the founder of Petra Speech, funding is very, very important. Now, aside funding, there's the need for emotional support, all forms of support, psychological, emotional, technical support, you know, love, affection from people around. Now, I understand that some of these children are kept in that facility and their parents do not come back to pick them. Okay, you can imagine it's summer and parents write to the school to tell them, oh, can we just leave them for the next two weeks and they will pick them up after two weeks. Mm. They're not getting the love and affection they need. Aside from funding, they need the love, care, support, in several forms, in several ways. And how do we show them love? By providing for their needs. Now, let's not forget, these are children. They are going to become adults. Some of them are teenagers. Some are not yet teenagers. So we'll be talking about their health, education, reproductive health for the girls and for the men. How do we handle these children? And that's why I said at the beginning that they need all forms of help, assistance, medical, health, psychological, in all forms, so that they can fit into society, so that they can become normal like other children, like other normal human beings. But more importantly, is the love, 
they need to get from their parents, from their caregivers, and from Nigerians, everyone, whoever has them. Okay, Elizabeth, there's one thing I would like to know. You know, um, children with disabilities uh, are said to be really creative. Mm -hmm. I don't know what type of projects um, or programs are being um, run there. Are there programs of skills development? Yes, they do. They actually do. They have uh, skills development programs for them. But the issue is they do not have the equipment to teach them, to train them. That's why recently an MOU was signed to leverage expertise of individuals, of institutions to help move and make that place function because the functionality of that facility is very important to any parent and to any government or to any serious government that understands the fact that they have such children in that facility to cater to their needs. They have so many uh, projects. You can, you can imagine they even have a water plant in that place where water is actually sold to members of the community, the host community in that environment. It is a project. Now, there is um, uh, um, sewing. They sew. Garments, textile and garments. They sew. Many of them are into craft, arts and craft. They can draw. They can put things together. They are very creative. They are smart. Their brains are sharper than normal, other normal human beings, but they do not have the ability either to move or either to see or either to hear well. But several skills acquisitions are in place for them to utilize. But the issue is there are no facilities, no equipment, no tools for them to work with. That's why they need the support of Nigerians and the government. So are we sure that this uh, memorandum of understanding will elevate the status of their center? Of course, because the MOU is expected to um, work holistically to leverage expertise of technical partners, like what Petra Speech is actually doing, to help them in speech delivery, language understanding, to help them move, to help them have um, inclusion, because that's the most important thing. Because if there's no inclusion, we can't even attain our SDG goal by 2030. So there's a need for inclusion. That is why Petra Speech is partnering with at the center so that these children can be normal because they are growing. Many of them will grow into adults. Of course they would because they are human beings. So some of these uh, projects or ideas they have come up with in the MOU that was signed, they are to be implemented. And how will they be implemented? It is through financial support, most importantly, financial support. They need the love of their parents. And funny enough, we understand that many of these children are really not getting the support uh, they need from their parents. So we call on parents to embrace these children. It might really not be easy uh, seeing them with a particular a condition. Like we were told, some of them are even ashamed to call them their children. But when they have that love, because they can't actually get all the love or affection the one from an outsider that is not their family member. But if you give them that love, that care, that attention, it will really go a long way in making their lives better and meaningful for the society. Okay, now on a personal note, Elizabeth, from your visit to the center, what was that moment or, or you know, that captured your heart or your mind? What I did you learn? What did you leave there with? Really, I, I, I have to be sincere. For every time I visit uh, a center with uh, such children, I tend to cry. The emotions are never mutual because you are like, oh, this is a very beautiful child, a very brilliant child, but there is a condition limiting that child to a particular facility. He or she cannot go out or can't do what another child could do. So it sends so much signals to everyone. But like I said, more importantly, it is the love, the affection that they get from us. So we need to love, love, and attend to their needs. More importantly, love, always. All right. We do hope that they find what they need. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for taking time to be part of the program again. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much, Zinred. All right. Now up next, how prepared are communities along the riverbank to welcome a very unpleasant visitor in Kogi State? Details after this break. 
Stay with us. Fellow Nigerians, this period may be hard on us, and there is no doubt that it's tough on us. But I urge you all to look beyond the present temporary pains and aim at the larger picture. All our good and helpful plans are in the works. More importantly, I know that they will work. You're still watching The Correspondent. Let's now turn our attention to road infrastructure. Now, if you are a regular user of the Meiduguri Dikwa Gamburu Federal Highway in Borno State, you will agree with me that the road has become a nightmare of some sort to motorists owing to its deplorable condition, worsened by its topography and the rainy season that is on now. But the good news is that the Bola Tinubu led administration has awarded a contract for the total reconstruction of the Dikwa to Gamboru section, that's about 60 kilometers using the paved concrete technology. Correspondent Mohammed Abubakar takes it from here. Another one down, with its content scattered all over, while many others are somewhere along the highway trading with extreme caution not to suffer the fate it suffers. Beside, those familiar with the highway say it's a daily occurrence not minding the sorrow it brings. The approximately 145 kilometer long road starting from Meduguri to Gamburu links Nigeria with sister African countries notably Chad, Cameroon, Central Africa Republic, Gabon and even Sudan underscoring its social and economic benefits to the host villages and towns. How do the highway's current condition affect those it was meant to benefit? I have been commuting on this highway for more than a decade. The rim of one of my tires just got damaged, thereby forcing me to abort my mission to Gamboru until the damaged rim is mended. I, as we speak right now, we have recorded six accidents involving haulage vehicles along the highway. I have been here for about two weeks now, to the point that we ran out of money even to buy pure water and the vehicle's owner is yet to come to our rescue. We have been here for more than two weeks owing to the bad condition of the road. Vehicles, especially those hauling goods, are up turning their contents, causing massive losses to the owners. The more it rains, the less our chances to continue with the journey, which means additional expenses for us. Thanks to the federal government of Nigeria for the decision to have the highway totally rebuilt, evident of which is the moving to site by the construction firm to handle the multi-billionaire project with earth moving equipment already on ground. This is the starting point of the 64 km Dikwa to Gamborungala concrete paved highway project being financed jointly by the federal government and Dongote Group. Now awaiting presidential flag up. When completed, it is going to link motorists from Nigeria to other African countries with ease. The excitement generated by the approval by the Federal Executive Council to rebuild the highway in phases is better imagined. To be honest with you, we are so happy to hear that the contract for the total rebuilding of the highway was recently awarded by the federal government. We don't even know how to thank the federal government for heading up to the appeals for the highway to be totally rebuilt. We receive with happiness the news that the contract for the rebuilding of the Dikwa Gamburu was recently awarded by the government. It will make our movement easy. Road construction is a top priority of the Bola Ahmed Tinubu led administration, especially for a road that is the gateway to about five African countries with a history as old as Nigeria. Many thanks, Mohammed. Now let's talk about the risk of flooding. There is a community along the banks of the River Niger in Kogi State, known as Ideha. 
It has been an epicenter of flooding since 2012. Now, as the rains intensify, the residents of Ideha are sleeping with only one eye closed with serious concern over their well-being as a result of the impending 2024 flood. Correspondent Salman Ayedeng reports from his visit to the community. An air of uncertainty hangs over Edeha, a community near Koton Karufi in the Kogi local government area. Today, Edeha is a shadow of its former self after years of flooding. Many residents tired of flooding have relocated permanently. Those who remain wish to leave but lack the means to start anew elsewhere. At the center of the community lies a primary school that has suffered from past flooding and is now in despair. Students have had their education disrupted multiple times as they sought refuge during floods, which has affected their academic progress. And so also from that 2012, we have been experiencing the water. It has become an annually for us. Every year we must experience here to 2022. 2022 also there was a serious leaf flood that took everywhere in the community, including our farmlands. Beneath the Motala Mohammed Bridge, the remaining residents, mostly fishermen and farmers, continue their businesses. But the fear of flooding is ever present, with rising water levels signaling danger. With the coming of the rains, the water level has started rising, and in no distant time, this market area will be flooded, and of course, the people will be left with no option than to relocate. Well, we are afraid, sir. We don't even have to save. Even now, we are afraid. Our mind is not settled. Residents who spoke to NTA News expressed a desire to move permanently to safer ground, exhausted from fleeing their homes with each flood. They seek government support to make this possible. There's no enough land, high land, where people can be to. So that is the challenge we have here. So we want to relocate. If government will come to our aid, honestly, we will we, be happy. In the past few days, the water level rose at an alarming rate. Efforts are required to mitigate the effects of another flood disaster in the community. As it is, the people of Edeha community in Kogi local government area can only hope and pray that this year's flood will not be as severe as predicted by NIMED. The devastating effect of flooding is the concern of all and sundry, which requires collective efforts to mitigate. Thanks a lot, Solomon. Now this concludes the correspondence this week. Join us again next week on another edition. From all of us here, it's bye for now. <laughs>